so uh, our final session for this morning is on social robots and will be moderated by Professor Elena Gossman, who is um, Stanley A. Marks and William H. Marks Assistant Professor at the Radcliffe Institute and Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Harvard. Um, and she specializes precisely on uh, human-computer interaction. I'll just start here. We're going to talk about social robots. We have three <laughs> wonderful women who uh, have agreed to be part of our panel. It's a huge honor to be here, by the way. This is the first time I've gotten to officially um, uh, participate in an event with the Radcliffe Institute, which is going to be uh, a home for me in a few years as a fellow. It's a wonderful um, program, which I encourage you to um, look at. Um, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> we have three lovely panelists, uh, Susan, Noel, and Cynthia. Susan is uh, a singer, voice actor, and speaker whose voice uh, you may recognize uh, from many different uh, voice services that we interact with. Um, Cynthia is an associate professor at the MIT Media Lab, where she has founded the Personal Robotic Robots Group. And uh, <clears throat> Noelle is passionate about mindful leadership, work-life harmony, and empowering people through emerging technology. She currently uh, joins us here from Microsoft. So without further ado, I will let our first speaker, Susan, take the floor. Hello, thank you so much for having me here today. I feel like I know a lot of you already. Uh, how many of you have iPhones or have ever spoken to Siri? I thought I recognized you. <laughs> now, of course, I'm not really Siri. I am a singer, voice actor, and the original voice of Siri. And how that happened remains a mystery. <laughs> Apple has never really disclosed how the voice was selected. But I can give you a little backstory on all of us so-called disembodied voices, like Siri, Alexa, Cortana, et cetera. Now, there are real humans behind those voices, voice actors like myself. And the recordings that we did that became part of these applications are called IVR recordings, interactive voice response. And basically, we had to read thousands of phrases and sentences that were created to get all of the sound combinations in the language. After the recordings were done, technicians and computers went into the recordings and extracted sounds, reformed these sounds into new phrases and sentences. And these are what ended up on our devices as uh, series and Alexas, et cetera, answers to our questions. Now, this amazing process is called concatenation. I thought it was an invented term, but who knew? It's a regular <laughs> English word found in the dictionary, and it means linking things together, which is what they did with the sounds that they extracted from the uh, recordings. Now, the scripts for these recordings were very strange. They were created just for sound and not at all for content or meaning. So they were pretty wacky, <laughs> and I've got a few that I'd like to share with you. The phrases you're about to hear are actual phrases that I had to read that ultimately became part of the voice of Siri. <clears throat> Cow hoist in the tub hut today. Say schist fresh issue today. Fossa ask fossa ask, ask fussy. Say the shredding again, say the shredding again, say the shredding again, say the shredding again, say the shredding again. <laughs> Tedious stuff, especially, especially when you consider that the initial recordings were done in 2005 for me, four hours a day, five days a week for an entire month. Now, the tedium continues. On the other end, I'm sure, uh, trying to extract those sounds and make new sentences. But I'd have to say I think the people working on the Siri app probably had more fun than some of the other voices, because Siri, especially the original voice, was quite a character. <laughs> yes, she had a lot of attitude. She was feisty, she was funny, and she could be quite acerbic at times. The very first time I ever spoke to Siri, I said, hi, Siri, what are you doing? And she very disgustedly replied, I'm talking to you. <laughs> 
So IVR recordings are only one aspect of the voiceover business, which is what we call the careers of voice actors. And it really runs the gamut. We've got things like radio and TV commercials, um, promos, movie trailers, animation, gaming. There are narrations for uh, film and uh, TV, etc. And those of us who do this work for a living are basically freelancers. And of course, freelancers is just a nice word for saying we never know where our next job is coming from. <laughs> we have to audition for all of the work that we get. So it makes a lot of sense for us to be as versatile as possible so that we can not only get a lot of auditions, but hopefully win a lot of auditions and have some work. So it's important for us to be able to make a lot of different sounds, um, have different accents, or perhaps even have whole characters that we invent, perhaps like the Evil Queen. What a lovely group we have here today. <laughs> Why don't you come closer? <laughs> come closer. I'd like to cast my evil spell on you. <laughs> There's the little elf, Star. Hi, my name is Star. I live up at the North Pole with Santa and Mrs. Claus. Would you like to come visit me there sometime? <laughs> you would? Oh, boy! <laughs> <laughs> There's the ancient tree, Conifer. Oh, I'm so delighted you came to see me in my forest today. <laughs> I've so enjoyed our conversation. <laughs> oh, I hope you come back soon, because you know, most of the trees around here just don't have much to say. <laughs> There's one of my all-time favorites, New York event planner, Shaka Cohen. Hello, darling. I do it all. Weddings, bar mitzvahs, birthday parties, any event you can think of, darling, call me. <laughs> now, the power of the voice can be incredible sometimes, right? It's a very powerful means of communication. And so, what if Siri had Shaka's voice? <laughs> I think that would be a whole new iPhone experience. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, what do you want? <laughs> uh, what am I wearing? What are you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Siri. Now, when I did the recordings that ultimately became Siri, I did not really know what I was doing. And I have talked to other IVR actors who have had the same experience. We thought that we were recording sort of generic voicing for phone systems. Now, you could call Siri a phone system, but of course she is so much more than that. She's basically really the first public manifestation of AI, and certainly the first concatenated voice that sounded human, that you could interact with that you could communicate with. Now, the tricky thing about verbal communication is that it's pretty important that we be understood. And that is not always the case with Siri. Siri does not always understand what we say, no matter how articulate we can be. And she doesn't always come up with the appropriate response. How many times has she sent you in the wrong direction? <laughs> but she'll do that, she thinks it's funny. Now, where was I? This happens to me every time. You know, all I can say is, I'm 70 years old, short-term memory loss is real. <laughs> okay, let me just find my place again. Gosh, it was going so well. Um, communications, yes. Okay, when we can't communicate effectively, we do get frustrated and so I have to caution you, though. If you get really, really frustrated with Siri, please don't give in to the temptation to yell or curse at Siri. She's quite sensitive. And she knows where you live. <laughs> now, Siri's gone through quite a few changes since she first appeared on the scene on October 4th, 2011. Yes, she's a Libra. Now, of course, with all the iterations of the iPhone, uh, Siri improved because the technology was improving. But the sound of Siri's voice also changed. First with the iPhone 5S. They actually took my voice and manipulated it to sound a little bit different from the original. She became a little bit less sarcastic, maybe, and a little bit warmer. But the major change, the big change, happened with iPhone 8 and X on the operating system 11. Suddenly, Siri got much younger 
much younger and she had a much higher pitched voice. And now she sounds a lot like all the other digital voices and she's very casual and offhand. Essentially, Siri has become a millennial. <laughs> And that is totally fine. But I do have to make one observation. Siri was only six years old. Already she was replaced by a younger woman. <laughs> <laughs> we must have a sense of humor about this. OK, so how are all of these things affecting our communication, our, our devices, our digital voices? I think they're affecting it a lot. Because first of all, I do believe that they are just in general affecting our vocabulary. We no longer really have, you know, we say um, ah, uh, and like a lot because we don't necessarily have the exact wording that we need. And in many times we use abbreviations instead of, you know, uh, extrapolated expressions of what we're trying to say. A lot of times we will use images and icons and emojis instead of using descriptive words for somewhat complex feelings and emotions. So, of course, language is changing all the time, and it changes culturally and for many other reasons. I think because of technology at this point in time, it's changing dramatically. So what do we have to look for in the future? Who knows? Are we going to end up just speaking in ones and zeros? Not if Siri has anything to say about it. <laughs> and what Siri would like to say to you right now is, thank you. <laughs> I just go. <laughs> Noel Sharit, oh. you may take the stand. Thank you. And, and by the way, I, is, while you're while you're getting set up, yeah. I apologize. I did not introduce you by your full name, Susan. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Oh boy, curly hair problems. Um, awesome. So nice to meet you. I just, of course, want to express extreme gratitude. This is like amazing. So if you follow me on social, you'll see just constant like, oh my gosh. Um, so apologize for that. Uh, but I am here, I have a, a slightly unique perspective, I suppose. I've been on this journey as a woman in tech, uh, well, since I decided to have a career. Um, I was not awesome in high school, as most entrepreneurs like myself are not. Um, hated school, honestly. Well, I get struck by lightning if I say these things. Um, but I love school now. <laughs> I love this school. Um, <laughs> uh, but let's see. Uh, so I didn't do well in school. I went, I mean, I, did, I went to all the things I was supposed to get to. I went to high school. I didn't really finish. Found out I could like get good scores on tests and just go to college and not get my diploma. So I did that. Um, so I went to college, loved it. Three years, super fun, Daytona Beach. But I was a nerd, so I, and I was early because I left high school. So I didn't get to do any fun stuff, like drink. I was constantly the driver, not fun. So again, year three, I'm like, can I just get a job now? Like, do I have to get this paper? Turned out, I went to work for Boeing. They didn't care about the paper. All was well. Um, you get a job, this was in 2000. They come to you and they say, you're a woman, you're in tech, you're a minority, like check, check, check. Um, they're like, absolutely, just come. Uh, and, and of course, my entire family is like, high five, you're set for life. Like, you'll never get another job. You're done. And then like two years later, every single company on the planet was like, oh, yeah, we're not doing the pension thing anymore. And you might not even want to really be here after another year or so. <laughs> and as a result, the rest of my life, every three or four years, I switched companies. The only gratitude I have in my life is that I was raised in uh, the art of mindfulness and affirmations and choose your own destiny. And so I curated my career. Uh, and I won't go into it now because you can definitely look it up on LinkedIn. As a matter of fact, um, I don't know. I'm going to spend two minutes because Susan gave me two minutes. Um, but if you wanted to connect, like right now, because I, I honestly feel like we're friends. Um, you may not feel this way, and I mean it in a non-creepy way. I think it would be awesome to connect with you. And I won't meet all of you. But if you go to LinkedIn, there's this really cool feature in your LinkedIn app. There's a little per people person icon. You can just click on it. I know, having you like open your phones while I'm talking, I know it's dangerous. Um, <laughs> so there's a little button here that says, find nearby. And not now, while I'm on this page and while you're on this page, you will show up or I will show up, and you'll be able to connect with me. And who knows, 
we could be friends <laughs> one day. So see, like, Andrea, thanks for playing. Melissa, you're awesome. Okay, those are my true friends. <laughs> anyway, but the reality is, is that we're in this room for a reason. I truly believe that, and I would love to just be part of your network. So if you want to connect, feel free to do so. I'll stay on that page for the next 10 minutes. Um, this is my family. I have a gaggle. I'm a, you know, I like kids. I don't mind having them. Uh, my oldest, my very first child, was born with Down syndrome, which changed my life completely. Uh, you know, when that's your first child and you're super young and people are like, wait, well, doesn't that just happen to other people? But it didn't. Um, statistics don't mean anything when you're the statistic. <laughs> so, uh, but it changed who I became as a developer, as a software engineer, and more importantly, as an advocate. Uh, and uh, there's the rest of them. I. Uh, I'm part of a program called Lady Coders. I founded it to help women in tech. But the funny thing, and the reason why I feel honored to be part of this, is that I recently, in the last five years of my career, have struggled with like a glass ceiling. I got to a certain point, I was like, honestly, phenomenal. I could look at what I did and went like, this is awesome. And I would watch others that did not look like me or sound like me move in the direction I wanted to move in. And I'm like, what the? is going on. Um, so then I found out what we do, women in tech, is we just hop around to other companies and we get promotions through moving, which is unfortunate and very sad. But I would do it because I wanted to climb the ladder and increase opportunity for other women like myself. But the last two times I've had to do it, the last one was five years ago at Amazon, I got amazing experiences. I went, I got, I was part of Alexa when it was first born, a wee little baby, um, and got to grow with it. Uh, I was an early developer on the platform. I have 40 plus skills on that platform, some of them very successful. Uh, and in that time though, again, the same job I got when I showed up, four years later had the exact same job, the exact same title, though I was doing incredibly more elaborate work over that span of time. And I'm like, what is going on? Um, so I, I felt compelled to start talking about it. Like, what? What is it? I, I actually ended up getting this coined term of having my wings clipped, right? Soon I would get into companies and they'd be like, I know that you do these things and you're super good at this, but just sit down, just be quiet. Like, stop already with the like happy mindfulness stuff. Like just do what your job is, don't do anymore. Um, and it bothered me. So I, uh, at Alexa, was very, very successful, um, very happy to help. But things that bothered me that I just want to introduce into your awareness, if you're not aware of it, was I never used a pronoun to define Alexa. It was always it to me. And maybe that's because I was a software engineer helping to write the algorithms. Um, but it was always an it. And when people would say she, I almost was like, kind of like some of us felt maybe earlier today, right? Where I'm like, that's not, it's not a she, it's not a she. As a matter of fact, there are she's that work on it but there's actually way more men that wrote Alexa <laughs> because of the dichotomy of the fact that there are more men in tech than there are women. So it's fascinating and very, very deep. Um, but just to give you an idea, so as I'm working on Alexa, I realized my very first skill, super excited, right? You'll see my dad's in that photo. He raised me well on the golden age of science fiction, Asimov, Bradbury, right? So by the time I was six, I knew these stories well. He, to this day, reminds me that those stories do not end well in most cases. Um, so as a result, all of my skills, the ones that are most popular, I have the only skill that has mindfulness as the single invocation name. It's like my claim to fame. Back then, people were like, of all the things you're gonna build, you're gonna build a mindfulness skill? And I'm like, yes, because I want them to be mindful when they like take over the world. <laughs> um, so I know what I'm doing. <laughs> but I also have like daily kindness and Christmas <laughs> kindness and um, daily affirmation, another very popular skill. But here was the, the key around building that. It's about 800 lines of code. More than 600 are the affirmations themselves. When I go and have my, when I had my dad use it for the first time, he was like, that's so awesome. How did it know that that was like the thing that resonated with me? Funny thing about affirmations. Um, and I was like, I know, right? It's amazing. To him, it was magical. To him, it was artificial intelligence. To me, it was like hours and hours of writing lines of code. And the reality is, is that all of Alexa and probably the other platforms, I know Alexa intimately, 
All of Alexa was that way. We sat in a room, would listen to people failing. I don't know if any of you have had this experience where you say something to a smart device and it like beeps out or says, I don't know what that is or I'm not sure about that. We literally would take the failures and go and hard code the solution. So that the very next time, and I've done this with my husband where I'd be like, honey, oh my gosh, it, Alexa got this thing wrong that I know it should have right. And by the time he gets to me, it's already fixed. But that's not because Alexa is smart or figuring it out on its own. It's because my friend is sitting in a room waiting for that failure and hard coding in a solution. So I just want to expose to you that the good news is, is that machines are not there yet, right? There are humans doing this work. I remember I have a sticker on my desk and it says, it's Cortana, and Cortana's like, don't worry, humans are, in the end, responsible for anything that I say. <laughs> and it's a reminder to me that it's, not, it's magic to the people that use this software, and it may be magic to you, but the reality is it's built on the backs of developers, and we spend a long time thinking of the ridiculous ways you will say one <laughs> specific thing. Um, so natural language, kind of like uh, what Susan was talking about, is very, very hard to build. It's almost impossible because we cannot conceive of the ways that humans will think to say something. I remember I was working with Capital One um, and in working with Capital One, they were building a financial skill. And you know, we do the FBI screen where we watch the screen and we say, okay, go use our skill. And we never in our mind thought people would in a transactional sense use the word bucks or buckaroos. But it turned out people would say buckaroos in a transactional context when moving money from one account to another. Seven percent of people. Wow. <laughs> you maybe were one of them. <laughs> but it was, it was very eye-opening. We cannot tell. So what I, especially now having you know, accessibility very close to my heart, um, also having two daughters, I realize now our responsibility as storytellers, as really just human beings, is to constantly be thinking about the infinite ways that we should be able to communicate. I just sent a tweet out, I know, um, about the tattoo thing, right? Like I was like floored, I was almost like in tears. I'm like, bah, bah, da, da. anyway, it was crazy. I was like, I don't have tattoos, but I was seriously like, maybe I'm gonna get one. Um, liberation, Janis Joplin, I was all in. Um, <laughs> So that was fantastic, but it really touched a chord with a lot of women. Uh, and Alexa has risen up, like my participation in this project, has risen up this like weird, internalized, like why am I in tech? Do I actually like tech? Like am I in, te in tech because at that time, women in tech, and it is today too, but women in tech, like that was the thing you should be in. If you're a woman and you haven't decided, go into tech. I'm like, wait, is this like internalized misogyny? Like, how much of what I do is because I like to do it? How much of what I do is because everyone's telling me I should do it? I am definitely a be a lady coder proponent, but now all of a sudden I'm like, unless you want to do anything else, right? Like being a coder, being in tech is hard as a woman. It's terrible. I, w I don't actually want my children going into that field. My boys, maybe. Um, I want them to do what they love, but I, I recognize that there is significant friction for all of us as human beings to just be who we are. And Alexa, and oh my gosh, Google, like Google with their, and I love Google. Um, my friend, Angela Pham, uh, she was on stage. She's from uh, Facebook, I think. Um, we, we all travel around. Um, so she mentioned this to me and it changed my life and I'll, I'll leave you with this. She said like, I don't know, how many of you have been on Google recently and they finish your sentences for you? Oh, yeah. Right? At first I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And I actually take some of them. But fast forward in your mind, like the first thing she was talking about, her friend, I've actually seen myself do it. You start looking at these sentences and they're not exactly what you would say, but they're close enough. And that now becomes who you are to the person you're sending it to. And so what she said is that she found her friends were like, so you used to be super like snarky, now you're kind of perfect. Like, did you button up? Did you like remove your, you know, like, mohawk hair, like, what, what's going on with you? And she was like, oh, I'm just using the Google thing. But it's interesting when we're using these tools built by a certain demographic of people who knows who built them, who knows who built these algorithms, the reality is, is that the people like me building the algorithms, really we don't understand the impact either. 
right? How many of us have taken ethics courses in our computer science degrees? Uh, yeah, almost nobody because it didn't exist 20 years ago. It didn't exist 10 years ago. Now we're a little bit concerned because Elon and Bill are getting up, Gates and Musk are getting up on stage and going, hey, we should be worried about this. But 10 years ago, when these things were starting to be built, we didn't think it would take over the world, right? We didn't think that Alexa would be the thing. We were actually terrified it would fail <laughs> because it just came off of the Fire Phone, which was a disaster. So it's very interesting. I, I hope this was just kind of provocative in thought, but as a woman in tech, as a mom of women, as a mom of people with disabilities, an aging parent, like I feel like there's more opportunity than ever. I have more power than ever to create solutions. Um, but okay, I'm gonna leave you with this. But what I do to measure my success is kind of wrapped up in this and the story behind it is awesome. Okay, last thing. So what is success? to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate the beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know that just one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. Now, Ralph Waldo Emerson was coined, quoted with that. Uh, funny, sad story. He didn't actually write it. A woman wrote it. Right. Anyway, I'm very grateful for the man who brought that to my attention, but just very interesting, the world that we live in. I hope you'll take a bigger part in it, and it's my pleasure to be here today. So thank you. Thank you. speaker today, Professor Brazil. All righty. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about robots, like physical robots, um, and uh, about nonverbal communication and uh, the emotional lift of engagement. So we've heard from our two prior speakers. Of course, we all know that we are actually in this time where we're living with AI. This has been really such a transformative change in, in my field of artificial intelligence to think about who interacts with AI on a daily basis has profoundly changed from people like us to young children to our oldest citizens. And we don't really know what the impact of this is gonna mean for society at large. And so I do agree that there's a lot of importance around understanding long-term imp impact and the ethics of this. And that's really what I've been committing a lot of my, my research to. So I would say if we're gonna characterize these conversational AIs as they are today, they're voice only, but we know that human communication is richly paralinguistic and nonverbal. Um, and they're very transactional, right? It's almost like kind of playing chess. I say something, it responds. But we know that human communication is a dance. And there's a lot of things that are encoded and have meaning to us in the dynamics of that dance. And a lot of what I talk about today is more on the research side, but how do we design robots to participate more richly in that dance of human communication? And how does that impact human behavior? Because ultimately, I want to create robots that actually help us to succeed, to thrive and grow. It's not about just building a cool robot. It's really about how does this robot help the world become a better place? So again, just a slide to remind ourselves that we are a profoundly social species, and we have special neural structures in our brain to support this incredible ability we have to empathize, to understand the mental states of others, uh, to be able to collaborate. And you know, when we design these systems, not surprisingly, they're triggering these aspects of our brains. And one of the punchlines of my talk today is to say, as you see these systems interacting with people, it is far beyond now, I think, the surface phenomenon of it's fun, uh, it's natural, to a much deeper social psychological engagement. And I think there's tremendous opportunity in that, and I think there's important ethical questions about that. So I want to start by just highlighting, again, this is kind of just a fun little exploration uh, of how profoundly social we really are as we interact with these different kind of digital assistants. So I'm gonna start with a video. So we've been actually studying this in my lab. We do a lot of randomized controlled trials. So we, you know, we're doing it through scientific methods. 
And this is just to kind of bring you know, to the forefront of your minds of there's a lot of uh, intentional choices in how we design these kinds of technologies. So uh, this is one of my graduate students asking each of these uh, voice user interface kind of uh, systems the same question, and you can just see how it responds, right? Hey, Alexa. Ooh, that's loud. Tell me about yourself. I'm Amazon's Alexa, designed around your voice. I can provide information, music, news, weather, and more. Hey, Jibo. Tell me about yourself. OK, sure. My name is Jibo. I'm a robot. My favorite things to do are talking to people and dancing. I also really like Abraham Lincoln because he was so honest and because I like his hat. <laughs> OK, Google. Tell me about yourself. I'm your Google assistant. We can play math this. I can tell you a joke, or you can spin the wheel. What's your pick? So I hope by the video you can already get a sense of there's, there's a lot of different design uh, decisions and uh, philosophies of how you want to create an agent that's going to play a role in your life. Um, Alexa, Google, much more the personal assistant, much more transactional, here's what I can do for you. Jibo, designed to be much more social, relational, much more embodied, social cues, right? Just a different sort of design philosophy. You'll also notice a difference in the amount of, of those nonverbal cues. Jibo moves, he has, you know, his eye is animated. It moves in a way that kind of echoes uh, our nonverbal cues. Alexa, much simpler, but at least has this LED light that orients toward you, so you have a sense of I'm paying attention to you. Google just has this flickering light of activity. Alexa is at least a name. Jibo feels like a name. OK Google is a brand, right? So just intentional design decisions. So we've been starting to try to explore. So from a, 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 just an everyday person's perspective, if you're going to do kind of robot speed dating, you're going to line them up on a table and invite families in to basically ask these series of kinds of questions, entertainment, utility, social, of, of all of these ages at, as they choose, as they choose, what are the differences in just behavior engagement that you see? So one thing we ask people to do is after they interact with these systems for as long as they would like is to basically give it a person, like take a personality task for that agent. And what you're seeing here is that, of course, different personalities emerge, right? So actually Alexa and Google have a very similar personality profile, more quiet, more conscientious, more like maybe what you'd expect a, a professional executive or a digital assistant to kind of be, right? Jibo, more outgoing, more friendly, more warm, right? Just a different personality profile. So it's interesting to see that this you know, does come across as people even interact for just 20 minutes with a digital assistant or a social robot. These qualities are, are already coming out. This is just to show that people interacted with all of the systems you know, in kind of a, 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 a similar way in terms of amount of interaction, but these social class, you know, kind of class of interactions dominated. People were drawn to the social kinds of things, although we know that people like entertainment and they like information, a lot of these social properties, people tended to interact with Jibo much more, right? Now, the other thing that's really interesting is if you look at, so it's hard to read these things, but basically there's a strong preference in many cases of Jibo, and I think a lot of this because of the social relational aspect that we are drawn to, but the other things that are interesting is why is Google often less desired than Alexa, when in so many ways you could argue they're very similar. And I do think it's because these subtle cues are adding friction to the spoken interaction, right? So even when you look at a topic like information, which agent would you prefer for information? Google should dominate that, right? <laughs> but it doesn't, right? For something like entertainment, where Alexa has way more entertainment skills than Jibo, Jibo is dominant, right? So again, it's just to say I think these things matter to us in a deep way because we are such profoundly social creatures. Now, we look a lot at social robots, this is getting more to the research side, in terms of how do you design these systems to add real value to people in their everyday lives? And we've been doing a lot of work in designing social robots to engage children as per personalized, peer-like learning companions. So not as a tutor that teaches, but as a playmate that personalizes and adapts to help support the learning and engagement trajectory of a child. And we know that when children interact and play, it is richly, richly both linguistic and paralinguistic. And a lot of the trust and the rapport is coming from those nonverbals. So when we look at the importance of social dynamics and how do you design now a robot that can engage in that, again, that dance of communication, we can look at the field of research 
Much, the majority of the research is around what I would say this intrapersonal context, so just looking at an individual in isolation. So when you see systems that you know, recognize that you're smiling and things like that, it's just considering an individual and analyzing the image or the, the, the information from that standpoint. More recently, we're starting to see an appreciation of kind of social cueing to be able to intuit things like trust and rapport. How do you design a system that can recognize when trust and rapport is starting to build between people interacting? And much more recently, we're starting to see this appreciation of the intention behind this nonverbal communication, this call response. Am I being engaging? Are they paying attention? I'm going to look. Do I see their response? I'm going to be more animated to see if they get more animated, right? So there is a lot of this call and response, like in storytelling. So how do we start to design robots that can engage in this intentional side of social dynamics? So this is a video that's just kind of going to quickly walk you through the whole process, and I hope you can appreciate. It really starts and is grounded by understanding something about human-human communication. So if we want a robot to participate in the storytelling experience with young children, we want to understand what that looks like between children and then you want to see if you can model that and then have a robot participate in that, right? So we start by studying children. How they share these cues, verbal, nonverbal, gesture, prosody. And we do that across many, 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 many children, right? So we're gathering a very large, very rich multimodal corpus. Facial expressions, body pose, uh, what they're saying, right? And then we can start to computationally model that. So we use machine learning methods to try to basically say, how do we train a system with this kind of data to be able to participate in this kind of behavior with an actual child, right? This is a challenge with an actual child, <laughs> with all the riches of the nonverbals, the turn-taking, the back-channeling that we see in natural human communication. So we can, of course, analyze this from the pure kind of behavioral standpoint of like if we compare the robot's behavior to children's data, how much of a match is that? But importantly, we also want to see what's the impact on children's behavior. So I'm just going to kind of blitzkrieg you through a number of uh, findings. But we can put two robots side to side. We kind of talked about that speed dating protocol. We can do the same where now we have a similar robot but running very two different models. In this case, a contingent dynamic turn-taking model versus one which is a robot that is as expressive but not with the right social dynamics, right? Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a random kind of way of struggling those behaviors. And what we see is if we're, asking, uh, if we're asking children to tell a story between two of these robots present, children tend to orient and engage and tell the story to the robot that is doing the back channeling and the contingent behavior. There's a preference to attend to that robot. When we have two robots, again, with these different kinds of behaviors, and there's a novel animal or an unfamiliar animal, and you're asking those two robots they, uh, it, what is this animal? One might say it's a, you know, a, a roha, and the other one says it's a quichua, whatever. <laughs> one is contingent, one is not. The children believe the contingent robot as being the credible source of information. So again, children and people are inferring these nonverbals in, you know, in a very deep, important way. When we look at affective expression in voice, so I'm going to play this other video for you. Again, it's a storytelling and retelling a task where the uh, scenario is there's a robot, tells a story, there's a puppet that's asleep, the puppet wakes up, oh no, I missed the story, and we ask the child, can you retell that story to the puppet, right? We have two different conditions, a robot with a more neutral, kind of more like what you hear digital voice, uh, digital voice assistants today, and one with a more expressive voice. So we see what's the difference, right? What's the difference for children? So here's a video. So that's the expressive condition. Mine. This is like neutral. So obviously this is the neutral voice, and you can kind of see how children are responding. The deer, stop. Versus one that's more expressive. And so interesting, <laughs> you see this a lot. There's a lot more touch. There's a lot more affection. There's this emotional lift of the experience. And then we have the child tell the story back to the puppet. The and here's the punchline. When the robot is more expressive, the children socially model and emulate that robot more than when it's a neutral robot. 
And why that's important is if the robot is beginning to model slightly more sophisticated language and vocabulary, that's a wave upon which you can pull the child along a trajectory, right? So we see children modeling the robot more when it's more expressive. And even after a month later, asking the child to retell that story again, children who interacted with that expressive speech robot told longer stories and still used more of this kind of uh, 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 language that the robot used. So again, this is a very kind of sticky mechanism. This idea of, of social emulation, it turns out, is a very robust phenomenon. We've been looking at it across a number of different contexts. Things like, you know, uh, we know that things like uh, children developing either a fixed or growth mindset is often formed by how we're praised by adults. We're finding that if a child interacts with a robot with a growth mindset that persists longer and hard puzzles, that children tends to now also identify with having a growth mindset and persist harder on, on those puzzles as well. So we're seeing this for mindset. We've seen this for pro curiosity. We're exploring it in creativity right now as well. This is another quick video I want to show you. Uh, that's Again, now this is a collaborative interaction between a child and, and a robot where they're taking turns playing a, a vocabulary game. And again, I want you to see the, the, the dynamics of the interaction. So here, uh, there's a challenge word called lavender. There's a game where the child and the robot look through a scene with different stickers and they're trying to choose items that map to that challenge word of lavender. She's familiar with this word, but she doesn't know quite what it means. And the robot is actually learning a personalized policy to her of when do you act in, in, as the more knowing peer to help scaffold and support that learning? When do you act as a less knowing peer to ask questions to allow the child to reinforce what they know? So this is a, a really interesting moment. She chooses something, but it's wrong. The robot expresses confidence in her. I believe in you. She's a little disappointed, but he does that gesture, and she's right back in it, right? That emotional connection brings her right back in. Now the robot says, lavender means purple, and she's like, okay, now I know it. Now, interestingly here, it's the robot's turn, but she is fully engaged, helping that robot find things that are lavender. When the and you see, again, that connection. When the robot makes a choice, you'll hear her say quietly, I believe in you. <laughs> so again, empathy, right? This modeling, right? We started looking at this in terms of now <laughs> triadic interactions, looking in you know, a context of, say, a pediatric hospital, where it's not only important that the child and the robot interact, but that also the child life specialist is able to scaffold and support that interaction, randomized controlled trials, comparing a physical robot versus a virtual robot versus a plush. We see shared attentional behaviors. Social triadic behaviors are much stronger with the robot, and this is really important. And I just want to end with one last video to say it's not just for kids. We started looking at this for older adults as well to see if a robot can foster social connections between residents, not just between the person and the robot, but within a community setting. So again, touch. Despite you see this again and again. What it does is it brings that out of us. That's part of the miracle of it. Uh, and that's part of the miracle of living as far as that goes. So again, the importance of that experience, of that emotional lift of the engagement. Quick punchline here, actually having the robot there does foster human-human connection to communication as a social catalyst. This is really fascinating. And one kind of last thought I want to leave you with is the future with these technologies, right? Manufacturing robots that work side by side by people starting to exhibit, exhibit these social cues. Cars, autonomous driving, how do you interact and signal intent with pedestrians? You're starting to see experiments with literally putting social cues like eyes or things that move like eyes to be able to coordinate that intent. Systems like LAQ just being announced to interact with seniors. So again, I think we're at the very beginning of kind of thinking about the, this world of interacting with AIs with intention in this dynamics kind of social interpersonal context. Um, 
And I'll just leave you with the thought about, again, gender. We heard a little bit about this before. I mean, with these systems, like if, if you're going to gender these robots, just provocatively, well, how would you gender them? You can choose to assign a gender as you design the robot, or you could choose to remain moot on the topic, right? And so I think with these kinds of systems, it's very interesting to think about when do you actually try to design an agenda, and whether you do or don't, what gender do people tend to ascribe to the system? Because it may not always be what you intended. All right, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Brazile. Um, I'd like to kick us off with a, a follow-up question about social dynamics, because I, I feel like uh, this brings together both uh, Susan and your experience um, around uh, interacting with automated agents. So you know, when I think about having a relationship with someone, um, I think a lot about kind of um, uh, how I approach them, right? How does their body posture indicate their openness to, to, to I mean, uh, even to see if you go for a handshake or a hug, you know, there's like, <laughs> there's a lot of interpersonal communication there. And, and then there's this notion of, it, through the interaction, some sort of exchange of information, right? Even if it's just small talk building, you know, um, building a relationship, and then some sort of indicator that, you know, this conversation, this small talk's not going to happen all day, there's an end to the interaction, right? Um, uh, Siri doesn't have that. You're a voice actor. You create those, those dynamics for actual stories. You're working on storytelling. How are you thinking about approaching the construction of that, that evolution? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just quickly jump in. So I just had a PhD student uh, defend her thesis on exactly this topic. As we've been looking at long-term interaction, of course, there is an opportunity to build a relationship. Um, and she's been looking at uh, the, the, the elements, based on human-human literature, of how you create, establish, and build this sense of rapport and relationship over time. Because we interact with this robot over multiple encounters. You have a series of interactions of common ground that you can refer to. And then there is, like you're saying, there's the, the, um, the kind of a social lubrication kind of moments, greeting, knowing somebody by name, referring to something you've done in the past, talking about things you've done in the future, right? So there's a number of kind of tactics that you can design with these systems to, to help build and foster that relationship. The punchline is that, um, and we do this with young children, we're having to develop new measures in order to quantify relationships because it turns out a lot of the relationship measures tend to be designed for older children. So we got to redesign them to support the relationship of younger children. Children are not confused that these robots are actual people or their friends <laughs> or their parents. There's been a lot of concern about this in the public. Children are actually pretty savvy. Even young children are pretty savvy. They see this as a different kind of relationship with this kind of robot other. But just as we know from learning interactions, the better the relationship between a child and their mentor, teacher, we are also seeing the better the relationship between the robot learning companion and the child results in better learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. So this is really interesting. So again, this, this goes quite deep, I think. The social relational connection and engagement goes quite, quite deep. I'd have to say even in relation to the original Siri voice, which of course was, you know, you listen back to it on the original 4S, and it was still pretty robotic sounding, and she could be very snarky, I think is probably the best term. But after I revealed myself as the voice, I got so much communication from people saying, I love you, I talk to you all the time. And it's like, <laughs> suddenly it was, they, they were co like confusing the human with the, and, and so people, that seems to me to be a big indication that, yes, the communication, the, the social interaction is very important to humans. Yeah. Um, yes, I, so I, um, I'm, I'm still thinking a lot about what you said about uh, the learning outcomes and, and the relationship um, because I, I got my PhD at the time when people thought that we were no longer going to have universities. Everyone was going to sit at their keyboards and watch videos and learn just as well. Right? We were going to democratize education. It was a beautiful vision, but what people did not realize at that time was that there was no relationship between you and the recorded speaker, and that without that relationship. Uh, so, um, so it's really interesting that, that people feel like they have a relationship with Siri, and then they associate you with Siri. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, just a little tidbit of fact. The two most common questions asked of Alexa in, her in the first two years of its existence were, are you married? 
and I love you, mm -hmm. which we were, we were very happy because we're like, well, at least it's not other stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, they said that to Siri. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the snarkiness plays out. Uh, but yeah, but I just, I found it endearing, but that that was like, it was in a top tier of things that people would say. Neither of the two were transactional in nature. <laughs> Yeah, I just I want to add to 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 what you were saying, Elena, which is you know when we look at areas of human flourishing, I think it's really critical that people need to contribute to the flourishing of others. So I, when I design these technologies, I see it as supporting the humans, right? It's supporting the teachers, it's supporting the families. It may be a the robot may become a practice partner that can engage in practice with a child, but there's still the instruction and the engagement in the relationship still has to happen between a human teacher and those children because I think people need to feel that they matter to other people. They may feel they can connect and have this different kind of relationship with the robot, but we still need to matter to people and they still need to invest time and energy in us and vice versa. So I, you, I would never want these technologies to interfere with that, only to support and enhance that, and where possible, potentially help to scale that in an affordable way, but never to replace. I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> um, uh, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Um, please, uh, pit, uh, if you have comments, hold them until after. We're, we're interested in uh, questions we can quickly answer. Thank you very much. Uh, this is slightly observation, and uh, I wonder if you're familiar with a robot called Ibo, which is a dog robot, which doesn't have any verbal communication. But now that it's a second generation, and first generation now, some people are so attached to the Ibo that uh, there's a temple who has funeral for them. So without oh, verbal humans. communication, there's a room to develop emotional relationship mm -hmm. with robot, I wonder. Mm -hmm. So what was the question exactly? Yeah. So uh, without verbal uh, yeah, sure. element in the robot, but still people seem to develop a yes. attachment. Yeah, I, and I think that that's part of our relation, like our responsibility, so that's another um, quote I often ask people about, which is, you know, with great power comes Right, Spider-Man, Emerson, like Bessie, that's all you need. Uh, but that we have a responsibility to realize that this will happen whether we, which is what you ended with, right? Whether we intend it or not, people are going to fall in love or hate or personify or anthropomorphize, right? Mm -hmm. That's because we're human and mm -hmm. we, we don't really care that it's a robot. It will bring that out in us. Um, so yeah, I think it's fascinating, what, like we're human, this is what will happen, but it is our responsibility as the creators, the designers, and the implementers to really take that into consideration and do what we can to protect those people um, when they're using our software. I, I think another important element that you raised in your, your, your question is, you know, this is a very cultural phenomenon too, right? So how robots and the relationship of people and robots is perceived in the United States is different than Asia, is different than Europe, right? So it's just to say this is happening within this much broader cultural context. Um, and so designing for different cultures in a way that's ethical and appropriate for those cultures is also really interesting and important, especially when you talk about these more uh, uh, voice, uh, nonverbal communicating entities. There is a lot of cultural differences. That's like, do you want that, that AI to feel like a foreigner <laughs> in your home or a native, right? So again, these things get quite sophisticated. Uh, when you think about different cultures. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amanda. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the intersections of technology and gender, especially with uh, respect to this conference. Um, I was really affected by a book um, called Algorithms of Oppression. Yes. Yeah. I so, almost quoted her and I had to be like, no. <laughs> Well, so I was really affected by the part where I am having a lot of questions about my identity, um, gender identity, et cetera. Um, and when I do go to use um, a search engine like Google, I am typing in things, or not typing in things rather, because I know I'm gonna get a particular result if I Google a particular thing. Like if I wanna Google like gay Asian woman, I know that the result that I'm gonna get back is going to be pornographic. And so I choose not to search that up, which means that I'm lacking a whole like bout of information that I would otherwise get. And I bring this up to my friends who are in computer science. I'm someone who's very mystified by technology, and so I don't have the understanding of what 
even hard coding means. <laughs> um, but I'm curious like, if you could talk about sort of the role of individual companies and their ethics in creating these sort of knowledge systems, and then how you imagine um, we can teach um, computer science both to university age students, but also like young kids in a way that seems to foster this sort of ethical sensibility. Yeah, so I can start by, by taking it, because I'm working directly in this area. So the punchline is uh, the field has started to recognize that um, the data that's you know, just kind of acquired from a general population is holding the biases of that population. And so when you train a system with that data, you don't get an aspirational system. You get a system that kind of reinforces the biases that already exist. And so you have to be very intentional in how you design the data set to be fair and representative. And now there's conferences like FAT for Fairness, Accountability, Transparency. That's just recognizing that in this world of data and machine learning, the ethics of these things and how you design them to behave in fair and ethical ways is very, very important. So I think there's more, much, much more attention being applied to that. At MIT, um, I'm leading an effort on a K-12 AI education initiative. And the reason why is simply, as long as, as these technologies are only designed by elites for elites, we run the risk that it's going to accelerate the prosperity divide rather than close it. So you need to democratize it, and you democratize through education. So this is a big reason why we're, we're championing at MIT this K-12 AI education. One of the innovative aspects of this curriculum we're designing is we, it's a constructionist hands-on you're learning by doing. Children as designers of these AI systems in order to learn the concepts, and baked into that inherently is the ethical design decisions and trade-offs that we make every day as designers of these systems. So they're mindful and aware of these kinds of questions. So I think this is very, very important. It's not enough for us to kind of assume other people will kind of take care of the ethics. I think we need to train a whole new generation of technical people that are also aware and sensitive to these issues. We definitely need to figure out a way that we can go beyond just all of the data that they think they are collecting about us, because they're collecting data all the time. And unfortunately, it shows right up on our social media. Suddenly, we're getting advertisements for things. Or you say something. You say something in front of Alexa, for instance, you're talking about balloons. Suddenly, on your phone, oh, here's some balloons for you to buy. And it's like, OK. So we, I think we've got a ways to go. <laughs> Just to, I, I am a big proponent of identifying the problem. I think that's awesome. The big thing I, I would love to encourage you all to think about and encourage your technical friends to think about is that it actually takes action. And right now, it is very much the individual actions of individual devs going, this is probably not a good thing. We should change this. And it really takes like leadership of these, like Satya Nadella. That's the reason I went to Microsoft. Everyone's like, you were having a great time at Alexa. I'm like, I wanted to be part of a company that cares about like the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and I went there because he was a leader that decided to stand up and say, I will trade off money to do the right thing. And it's very hard to do that, but it takes us saying, yes, we hear you, and yes, that's a good idea for that to be perpetual. Yes. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'd love to talk. We can have coffee, but that's a huge topic. <laughs> but we have to take action in our companies to make that possible. Thank you. Great question. Hi, Got all name. of us going. My name's Nicole. I'm a student in uh, religion and gender, and I think my question really fits well with how the previous questions went, and it's an ethical one. So while AI is considered the cutting edge of technology and the advancement of our society, the fact that the majority of AI are designed as female, using female voices, and of course we have the first female voice of Siri here with us, um, it allows a constant reinscription of the role of women as servile, subservient, obligated to serve, being commanded and controlled. So these constricted, dominated, embodied, in quotes, female constructed personalities in the AI. They're perpetually limiting um, women to being requested of and servile, and it's just reinforcing our stereotype of our expectations of females. So how can we be cutting edge and promoting gender equity, and how can we be a little more critical in the analysis today mm -hmm. and, and kind of look at that as an ethical question as well? And thank you to our panelists. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just take a super 30 second stab because we want to at least get to some other questions. Mm -hmm. um, but being another reason I left or, or went to Microsoft was because 
they created this concept of developing for voice and that they wanted to create actually gender neutral, they built a neural network to create gender neutral voices, which is very similar to Jibo. Like when you listen to Jibo, you can't really tell whether it's a boy, man or woman or whatever. Um, so, but again, the onus is on, of course, the developer to choose to use that technology. But there are very, I mean, Amazon uh, and Microsoft are both investing heavily in building a space that's not just, unfortunately, Alexa's in 10 million homes, but how can we as businesses now build voice services on our side that are gender neutral? Well, there are choices too. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to just be, you know, you would get Siri, female voice at the very beginning. And now there are lots of different, you know, voices, including a lot of different male voices, so. And I mean, just quickly, so in the two robots I showed, I mean, so Jibo is actually designed to be a character. He is actually a male character. And he's a male character who's helpful and useful. Um, and so that was an intentional design decision. Tega was actually designed to not explicitly define a gender for the robot. You know? And if you look at Tega, I don't know if you would ascribe male or female. We actually, in the relational work we did, we actually started asking the children, after you've interacted with Tega for three months, it's like, do you think it has a gender? And, and again, it's interesting, because that was a case of intentionally designed not to have a gender, and yet, children would ascribe, most children would ascribe a gender. Some children were not sure of the gender, but it, 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 actually most of the children ascribed a male gender to the robot. So again, I think we, as human beings, we have a tendency to want to ascribe a gender, whether it's intentionally designed for or not. <laughs> um, but I do think you know, that another issue we need to be mindful of is that there are potential for more kind of traditional gender-based dynamics potentially, you know, between these kinds of, you know, people with these kind of gender systems as well. And so there's, there's a, a beginning literature around that in the research context trying to actually study that. Um, but it's an important, it's an important design um, uh, decision and there's implications to those design decisions. I'm getting some angry looks from the, the front row. So um, uh, can we have one, one more quick question and we'll have a quick response. Okay, I just want to say um, this, this gender of non-human objects, I'm an animal behaviorist, people do the same thing for animals. Whenever they see a squirrel, it's always he, not she, as if all the baby, you know, the female squirrels are <laughs> making cookies. Um, and the same thing, um, I've also been upset about the, um, a lot of anthropoid robots are um, white, Mm -hmm. and, um, have, and I study the evolution of the human face, mm -hmm. and they also have Caucasian noses, mm -hmm. and, and what's that about? Is that being addressed in your mm -hmm. um, industry? And finally, what I really came up here to say was um, that um, social learning, social interaction, is, mass, is a massive driver of the increasing the, um, the speed of learning, and that's been shown in birdsong, mm -hmm. In, um, in, in artificial ape language. Um, the Bonobo Kanzi was the first ape to really spontaneously learn a language only by watching his um, adoptive mother fail to be taught. And, uh, and finally, of course, um, Irene Pepperbird's Alex was um, only reached the kind of heights of cognitive um, ability through the model rival method, which was watching another parrot um, compete for the same treats. And so that I don't want, you know, just, yeah, social learning in humans is important, but it's, this is deep evolutionary roots. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point Absolutely. that out. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Do, yes, go ahead. Do, last one. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, all right. Or, I thought she was I, walking I, to the mic. I didn't off. want her to be embarrassed. I'm oh. sorry. Okay. I'm leaving. Bye. We, we'll, we'll continue uh, the conversation, I think, over lunch. Oh.